Hi, I'm Melanie, and you're about to watch a message that was preached here at Calvary Fellowship in Miramar, Florida. At Calvary, we exist to help you take your next step in your relationship with God, and we pray that this message helps you do just that. How's everybody doing? We are glad that you're here. I appreciate those of you guys that prayed for me because uh, I had no voice this past Sunday. I'm feeling much better. Those of you that weren't here at church, didn't know, thanks for nothing. So anyway, but I'm just playing. So I had this weird thing happen to me um, about a week ago. So my family and I, we were at home. We were swimming in our pool. My 11-year-old daughter Mia goes inside to get something. And then a few minutes later, the kids are asking, saying that they want to, uh, they want me to make lunch. So that's my day off. So I'm like, all right. So I get out of the pool and uh, dry myself off, wrap myself with a towel, grab the door handle to go inside, and I pull the door handle clean off the door. I am so grateful that my daughter Mia went inside, which I can only attribute to God's grace in my life, or I would still be outside right now, or I'd be giving this message in my bathing trunks. Those are the only real options. So, um, so I make lunch, and then I say that I'm going to go to Home Depot, and I'm going to buy a new door handle, because that door handle ha had been giving us a little bit of trouble. So I go to buy a door handle. Well, truth be told, I went and bought two because I have two ways to get outside. Um, there's a, actually a door that leads out of our bedroom to our backyard, and th that which is always locked. We never use it. And then there's the door we always use off our kitchen. So I said to myself, oh, what I'll do is I will just, I'll switch the handles because I never use that other door anyway, so it doesn't matter if it doesn't really work. Well, anyway, in the process of switching the handles, I broke the other handle. Not really important part of the story, but so anyway, just in the spirit of keeping it real. Um, but I broke the other handle, so I went to Home Depot, bought two, and then I start installing the first one. And it's not going well. Um, and I'm very frustrated. And, and so, it, and it's just, you know, and once again, it's like, People asking me, well, did, what, did you read the instruction? Like, of course not. <laughs> it's a door handle. How hard can this possibly be? Apparently harder than I thought. And so anyway, um, so my wife says, well, why don't you install the other one and see if that one works? I install the other one, and I'm telling you, I'm like, I have a second career in door handling. Uh, if, if this, does, you know, so that's what I'm thinking is that I, I could do that uh, because it works so well. So now I go to go back to the original one and uh, because the whole thing is giving me problems. And so I take the whole thing apart, just lay this whole thing out. And I watch a YouTube video from, because that's like my new thing now, <laughs> whenever there's a question, go to the YouTube. So anyway, so that's kind of been my thing. So I go to the YouTube, to, to, to the YouTube channel and the company has a uh, they have their own channel with all of the different, or most of the models. Of, uh, they have all the models except mine, by the way. Um, and then, and it's like this young girl that's on there, and I don't know why I found her so aggravating. I, pr I honestly, I did, and I'm sorry, but I did. And she's like, "It's so easy to install our door handles," and I'm like, <laughs> "Shut up!" And uh, I'm, I was not handling this well. And uh, to say, it's so easy, anyone can do it. Like, apparently not, lady. And uh, so anyway, I take the whole thing apart. I mean, like down to the screws. Because Albert Einstein said, if you don't understand something, you don't understand something until you take it apart. Actually, he didn't say that. I told my family he said that, and I think it went over. Like, oh, well, if, 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 if Albert said it. And because um, we're on a first name basis. And so anyway, so I take the thing apart. I reassemble it, connect it to the door. I mean, piece by piece, I connect this thing. It wasn't work. The problem was is that it was working. But you know how doors have like this little uh, inner lock. The bolt was working, but not the inner lock on the handle. And that, it was just aggravating me. So I get it. And now I get this little uh, piece. And, and it's like I get the whole thing working. And I am like, it's a typical man, and I make my proclamation. It is finished by the power of Grayskull and, and invested in me by the state of Florida. Anyway, I'm saying all this stuff. And so I've done it. All I got to do is tighten it together. And so I got it. Everything's working, locking. I screw it in. It's done, and the thing doesn't work. And I'm like, are you kidding me? 
If I have to listen to one more minute of that lady telling me that it's easy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose my mind. So anyway, I take the entire thing apart again. By the way, three hours have passed since I went to Home Depot. Now my kids, they were asking me about lunch. They've just started asking about dinner. And so I'm, I'm, I'm getting this. So I reassemble it. And then I get it to the same spot. I got the thing, the little bolt goes in, it locks, perfect. All I have to do, all I have to do is tighten two screws, literally, uh, two screws on either side. They just go in and it's done. So I'm just, and, and the other time I went fast and I'm like, no, this time we're gonna take it slow. We're gonna do it right. Measure twice, cut once. That has nothing to do with screwing stuff in, but I just, I'm just throwing out any carpenter lingo that I know. Anyway, so, uh, so I'm getting, I'm going, okay, da, 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 da. perfect, it's all in, let's do this, and the thing doesn't work. And I'm like, you know what? Forget it. I don't care. I will open a window if I need to go outside. <laughs> and to this day, if you want to get outside, you can open the door, you just can't lock it. This morning, my son went outside, he wanted to see what the weather was like. He's like, Dad, I can't lock the door, what do I do? And I, I, I'm like, well... How, what would you do? How would you feel if you were, oh, hold on, hold on to the handle. Uh, hold, he holds the handle. I'm like, well, how would you feel if you were inside a blender? He's like, I'd be like, this. all right, now lock it. And then it locks. So you got to kind of like go crazy and, and then jiggle it and lock it. So that's the, my whole, anyway. So this is why nobody ever goes outside in my house anymore. It's like, yeah, I'll go outside when they air condition it. So anyway, but this is the problem with human accomplishment, right? It's imperfect. But tonight, listen, we're going to spend our time looking at um, this phrase that Jesus said. It's, there, there are seven words that Jesus spoke when he was on the cross, uh, seven statements that he made. And, and a few years ago, we started working through each one of these statements. And we've actually made it through the first five. Tonight will be the sixth. The next year, we'll do the last one. This is like the longest teaching series ever, uh, seven years. Um, but, um, but the statement is, it is finished. And, it's, it, and, and the thing is, it's three words in English. It's one word in Greek. The Greek word is tetelestai. And in our time together, what I want to do is explore what Jesus accomplished when he cried out, it is finished. Because listen, that word, it is finished, or, or in the Greek language, tetelestai, is a robust word with a variety of meanings. In fact, what we're going to look at is this, this word, it is finished, means it's done, it's complete. But depending on your vocation, depending on what you did, depending on the situation that you were in, you would use that phrase, to tetelestai, it is finished, for a different reason. And we're going to explore that. We're going to explore what Jesus did on the, on the cross that day when he cries out, it is finished. Because, listen, in the Greek culture, they would use it in six different ways. And what's amazing to me is that Jesus accomplished every single one of those ways. So we're going to look at it, and we're going to start in uh, John chapter 19, where he says, it says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. And behold, or, or now, <clears throat> a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when he had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. You see, this phrase, it is finished, that word, tetelestai, it's, it's, there's so many implications. And so um, what, is, what does it mean? Well, it all depends on who you were. So we're going to start, if you're taking notes in your outline, um, we're going to start here. If you were an artist, tetelestai, the artist says this, the picture is perfect. The artist, listen, a, an artist would tirelessly labor on a painting that he or she was working on, and at some point they would drop their brush and say, to tell us die, the picture is finished. And listen, Jesus, like an artist, has recognized that his life was a picture, that he was the fulfillment of 300 Old Testament prophecies all painting to what the Messiah would look like. We heard it earlier as Pastor John was, was sharing from the book of Isaiah. This was all written 800 years before Jesus was born, and yet it was a perfect picture. This is why 
in your notes in Luke 24. Listen to what Jesus says to the disciples as they're walking on the road. He says, then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were spoken, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You see, everything in the Old Testament, every, everything was a picture. And Jesus recognizes that at the last moment, that he has fulfilled every prophecy. He has crossed every T. He has dotted every I. And now the picture, the painting is complete. And he's able to say, listen, the painting is done. The picture is complete. It is finished. Do you understand that if Jesus were to fulfill a person just to fulfill eight Old Testament prophecies, what were the chances of eight Old Testament prophecies? And you can pick whichever eight you want. I mean, just eight of them would be one in one quadrillion. Like quadrillion, yeah, we don't, that's, that's, I mean, that's like what comes after trillion. You're not just, if you live long enough, you'll see the national debt get there. Um, <laughs> but one in one quadrillion for a person to fulfill just 48 of the prophecies would be one in 10 to the 157th power. So when Jesus says it is finished, he knows that the picture has been perfectly painted so that we would believe because no one else could do what he did. You see, the artist says the picture is perfect, but then there's another person, number two in your notes, the servant. The servant says the work is done. You see, a servant in that culture would come into his master's house and say to him, to tell us die. It is finished. That the work that he has been given, the list of things that he had to accomplish, that it has all been completed. Jesus, faithfully serving the will of his Father, did the very thing that his Father had asked him to do. He had completed the work. In fact, just a few hours before that, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, in John chapter 17, the Bible says this. In, in, in John 17, Jesus praying to his Father, he says, I have glorified you on the earth, and I have finished the work which you've given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. You see, that means when it comes to the work of forgiving your sin, that work is completed. So guess what? You can stop beating yourself up. You can stop not forgiving yourself because he's already forgiven you. The work is done. It's finished. To tell us die. The third is a judge. You see, when a judge says to Telestai, the judge is saying justice has been served. Justice has been served. The judge looks at a prisoner. He served his time. He's saying it's finished to Telestai. This, this gentleman, this, this person, this man, this woman, they have served. Their debt to society is paid. And listen, this is one of the moments where we ask the question, and uh, if you've been with us on Good Friday, this is one of the things that I try to, to slow down and answer every year. Um, so if you're like, hey, I feel like you've heard this before, you have, because I talk about it every year. Um, so if you are hearing it, that's a good thing, because it means you've been here. Um, but I, I want to answer this question, and that is, why did Jesus have to die? Because there are people um, who don't believe, and, and they'll ask that question. And if we're Christians, the typical answer that a Christian will say was, well, Jesus died to pay the price for our sins. Okay, but have you ever thought about that? Let's look at that answer a, a little deeper. I mean, you forgive people, right? People have hurt you deeply. People have sinned against you. People have said things that they shouldn't, done things that they shouldn't. People have said that they were going to do things and didn't. And yet you forgave them, but you didn't require a sacrifice, right? You know, someone didn't cut you off in traffic and then pull over. Hey, I'm so sorry at the light. Hey, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. Like, yeah, man, I'll forgive you but give me your spare tire and we'll call it even, right? Like you're not, you're not asking that. So here's, my guess is you didn't. You forgave out of the kindness of your heart. So why is it? And we would all agree that God is much more forgiving than we are. So why is God requiring something of us that we don't require? This is really at the heart of the matter. 
And those of us that have conversations with people who don't believe, I think this is such an important thing for us to understand. Why is God asking for a sacrifice when we don't? Okay, so we're going to do that. We're going to start at the beginning. Where's the, in the beginning? In the garden? No, not in the garden. Start, the, the story starts in my sister's basement. Um, my, my older sister uh, lives in Boston. And one Thanksgiving, Carrie and I were there. And um, if, if you live in New England, most people, they build out their basement. So basement kind of becomes like another living room, family room. And so that's basically where my two uh, nephews basically lived, was in the basement. And um, they had set up, uh, they had like their own fridge down there. I mean, this is like, they were in high school at the time, but they had like their own fridge, their own TV, and they had um, all these games set up. And so we were playing darts. And um, so they go, we're, we're now taking turns, and this is like, they're like serious about darts. They know how to keep score and the whole thing. So I'm like, all right, fine. So they have this little mark with duct tape. This is the where you throw the darts from. Anyway, they walk upstairs. I throw the dart and hit the bullseye. I'm freaking out. They come downstairs, and I'm like, dude, I hit the bullseye. So amazing. I, I, I get, you know, it's like some ridiculous amount of points you get when you hit the bullseye. And they're like, Uncle Robert, you're so funny. Uh, seriously, what did you get? And I'm like, oh, no. Just because you weren't here doesn't mean it didn't happen. And, uh, and anyway, so that led to an argument, and then me having to say, I'm older than you. You do what I tell you. And um, so, but what happens is, is that, but it starts with the bullseye. But here's the thing is that most of us know this, even if you've hit the bullseye, um, a lot of times we miss the bullseye. We miss that mark. And that's what the word sin means. The, the, the word sin is the Greek word hamartia. Hamartia is an archery term. It means to miss the bullseye, that you're aiming for the bullseye and you miss it. The Bible would say it this way in the, in the, in the book of Romans. The apostle Paul says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So that is that when I mess up, when I say what I shouldn't, when I do what I shouldn't, when I know the right thing, but I decide not to do it anyway, I miss the mark of perfection that God has established. And so the next question is, what's the penalty for missing the mark? That's what begins at creation. God sets the standard for the very first people, our very first grandparents who showed up on the earth. And he tells them, he says, the Lord God said, out of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for the day that you eat it you shall die. And obviously it wasn't physical death because they ate it and they lived, but there was a spiritual death that happened. There was a separation from God that took place. And I want you to understand what's happening, that God is setting the harshest sentence possible for, this, for these infractions, for anything that is less than perfection. And we might think that's too strong. And we struggle, well, I don't know why God just doesn't forgive me because I'm, I'm generally good. And that may be the case. The problem is the goal isn't to be generally good. That's not the bullseye. Good enough is not the standard. Perfection is the standard. In the book of James, the Bible says this, and the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as the person who has broken all of God's laws. For the same God who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. So if you murder someone, you have broken the entire law, even if you do not commit adultery. What, what this means essentially is, it's like when a police officer pulls you over for speeding, because you're going 80 in a 45, and, and you tell the police officer, officer, I understand that I, I, I sped, but I want to explain to you all the, all the laws that I have obeyed while I was speeding. My seatbelt is on, my hands 10 and 2, I even used my, single, my, my signal, which no one in this county does, um, as, I was, as I was speeding, that's, and so because of all the laws I haven't broken, you shouldn't give me a ticket. But see, that's not the way it works. Justice demands payment. This, my friends, is why Jesus died. Because God is not just loving. We forgive because we are being loving. God is not just loving. He is also just, and justice demands payment. So what God does, this is the genius of the gospel. God sets up the highest standard, and the harshest possible penalty so that no one can say that he's playing favorites. He sets the highest standard and the harshest penalty. The Bible says the soul that sins will surely die. And so what, but what does he do? As the judge, he says that's the penalty, but then he takes off the robe and he himself pays the price. That's the glory of the gospel, my friend. 
And that's why he is so incredibly loving and, and incredibly just at the same time. That's why the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because the reality is that God doesn't forgive like we forgive because when we forgive, we're just, our acts of forgiveness are acts of love. When God forgives us, they are not just acts of love, they are acts of justice also. That's why the Bible says this. Notice what he says in 1 John. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness because you and I forgive arbitrarily. We forgive who we want, when we want, if we want. But for God to be who he is, he's gonna forgive everyone who calls on his name, seeking to be forgiven. And see, the problem is, is that if, if he only forgave certain people, we would cry that it wasn't fair. So what God does is that he sets the standard. It's the highest standard and the harshest penalty, and he himself paid it. And so what happens is, is that Jesus cries out, it is finished. He has paid the penalty for now you and I to call on him and be forgiven. <laughs> Number four, the priest. If you were a priest, you would use the word to tell us die. The priest says the perfect sacrifice is here. You see, one of the things that was set up in the Old Testament is that you couldn't, um, you couldn't offer just any sacrifice. It wasn't just any offering that you wanted to give. The offering had to be perfect. It had to be, to use the biblical language, it had to be without spot and without blemish. And the idea was is that when we give to God, we give God our very best because he deserves our very best. And that was the picture of Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice. The Bible says it this way in 1 Peter. He says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by the tradition of your fathers, but with, you, were not, you weren't uh, redeemed by those things, but look at what you were redeemed with, the second part, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without spot and without blemish. When Jesus says it is finished, there's no more need for a sacrifice. That's why the veil in the temple was ripped from top to bottom, because it was over. You see, the accountant says something different. That's number five. When the accountant says to Telestai, the accountant is saying it's paid in full. Paid in full. When, uh, when you finish, in that culture, when you would finish paying a bill, they would actually stamp it to Telestai. And in fact, one of the things that archaeologists keep finding is these pieces of papyrus. Now, papyrus is um, a plant that they would uh, hammer out and roll out to turn into uh, pieces of parchment. And they would find these pieces of parchment with all the, this numbering and then stamped to Telestai saying that this person had a bill, they paid it off, and it was paid in full. And this is exactly what happens at the cross, that Jesus paid the debt that we owed, that the wages of sin is death, but Jesus paid that price on our behalf. Now the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible tells us in the book of Colossians, it says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Do you remember, have you ever paid, anybody ever paid off a car? Like you bought a car, you paid it off. All right, some of you are still paying. It's okay. <laughs> but take financial peace, it'll help. Um, so I remember when we paid off our minivan. It felt so good. We got a title. Uh, the title in the mail was paid off, and we got it just before the thing started breaking down. And uh, you, know, you ever notice that? Like, hey, you know, you, this warranty is bumper to bumper and for two weeks until you, until you need it. And uh, it's like, no, I had bumper to bumper. Yeah, but that expired. Like, when did it expire? Three days ago. Like, <laughs> wow. It, it's almost like you knew that was going to happen. So, but listen, Jesus pays the price once and for all. And this is what blew the minds of the Jews because the Jewish system of sacrifice, the Jewish system of worship, of worship is a perpetual sacrifice because we always sin. So there's always a sacrifice. But Jesus dies once for all because there's never going to be a more perfect sacrifice and we're never gonna need to improve on it. But then there's the last one, and this might be my favorite one. It's what the warrior says when he says to tell us die. 
The warrior says the battle is won. That's what he says when he cries to Telestai. When the warrior was on the battlefield, the commander, and he cries that to the people, to his soldiers, that means that they have overcome their enemy. And he would, they would shout, it is finished. The work is done. The battle is won. You see, Jesus was victorious on the cross because he defeated death. He defeated sin. He defeated the plans of Satan. He won. The Bible says this in, in Hebrews 2. He says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who for all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Jesus' resurrection, his death and resurrection are the promise that there is more to this life than just this life. That there is an eternity waiting for us with God. But there's another victory that I, that I want to note that I'd be remiss if I, if I missed it. And it's found in the book of Romans. It's probably the last verse on your outline. It says this, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, Certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I pause there. There's so much there. There's probably an entire message just on that. The whole idea is this. He says, reckon yourselves dead to sin. Now, that's not like our southern brothers when they say the word reckon. Let me tell you something, I reckon. That's not, that's not what the word reckon means. The word reckon that the Bible is using is actually an accounting term. He's saying, listen, think it through, add it up, write it down. This is what it means. Reckon yourselves, consider it, add it up, figure it out, that you are dead to sin but alive to God. That means not only did Jesus conquer hell and death, he also conquered sin. That sin is something that when we've come to Jesus that used to have control over us, but now we're free. Years ago, I, I, uh, I officiated a wedding for a friend of mine and my old boss was there. You ever have a moment where you see like your old boss? It's so awkward because now he's not the boss, just like some random guy. But I remember seeing him and, uh, and, I, and I had this thought like, I wonder if he's going to ask me to like do stuff. Like, all right, let's go back to the office. I got some stuff for you to staple, you know, if people are still stapling things. You know what I mean? And I remember that, and I was nervous. About, but here's the thing. But I didn't have to. And I, because if, even if he did, and he didn't, but if he did, I would say, hey, listen, I don't work for you anymore. You don't have any power or authority over me anymore. And therein lies the key to understanding this verse. Listen, the death, Jesus died, to quote that passage in Romans. He didn't just conquer hell and death. He conquered sin. You see, it's been, according to the passage, it's been done away with, or literally rendered inactive. That's why he says, now you got to do away with your old man. Now that's not a reference to your dad. All right? Your old man is the reference to the old you, the person that you used to be the addictions that you used to have, the tendencies that you used to um, deal with, the, the, the old sins that used to kind of have you bound and, and have their hooks in you. He's saying, listen, when you came to Jesus, you were freed. And now we can walk in that freedom because we can reckon ourselves dead to those things and alive to the things of God. And that's why he says in verse 11 at the end, he uses that phrase, likewise. In the same way that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and is now alive to God, we 
have died. That old person has been done away with. That's why when a person is baptized, um, they go into the water, the Bible says, because when they go into the water, it represents Jesus in his death, in his burial. And then they come up, same chapter in Romans, they come up in what the Bible calls the newness of life. That it's like that person you used to be, they're going into the water, and then the new person is coming out. You see, so when we come to the communion table, you see, it's our moment to remember that it's not just, hey, he died for you. He didn't just say, it is finished, to say something. Oh no, he said, it is finished because he's an artist, because he was a servant, because he was paying the price, because justice has been served, because we can stamp it that it's been paid in full. And we, he can also, it's the battle cry that it's finished, that the war, the battle has been won. And so as we spend a couple of minutes in communion, listen, maybe that's what we need to consider. And perhaps for some of us, some of these ring, they hit a little closer to home based on what we're going through, based on what we're dealing with. But listen, every single way that to tell us die is used, he fulfilled. That's the beauty of Jesus. That's the beauty of the scriptures. They said it's meeting us where we are and maybe this is our moment where we see God do what only he can do in our lives in this Good Friday service. So I'm gonna invite the ushers to come forward, hand out the elements. You hold on to them as the band sings and we see God do a great work in us. Go ahead, church. Grace that flows like a river Washing over me Fount of heaven, love of Christ Overflowing me Thank you, Jesus set me free Christ my Savior you rescued me thank you Jesus you set me free Christ my Savior, you rescued me. You've given me life, you've opened my eyes. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. You've entered my heart. You've set me apart, and I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. You've given me life. You've opened my eyes. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. You've entered my heart. You've set me apart, and I love you, Lord. set me free Christ my Savior you rescued me the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11 he says for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the cup of the bread together. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the cup together. And Lord, we are humbled that you would call us your own, that you would pay the kind of price that it took to forgive us and yet, Lord, we are so grateful. You died for us. And so tonight we commit anew that we will live for you. We will look to you, focus on you, and not let anything distract us. God, you want to transform us. You want to do a great work in us. And the good news is you're not done with us because your word says that you started a work and you're not going to stop until it's finished. So we thank you for that. We pray it in Jesus' name and everybody said amen. 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 We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you decided to take your next step with God and follow Jesus, please visit mycalvary.com forward slash begin. We have a free gift we'd love to give you. Also, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and also hit the subscribe button down below. From all of us here at Calvary, God bless you.